big opportunity that China is for marketers. Uh, I'd like to find out something that you've only recently learned that you wish you had known years before. And can I start with you, Miguel? Um, I, I, I guess, well, I, I, let me say that I lived in China for five years and I was managing our business there uh, for five years. And, and I, I guess that I was absolutely ignorant about um, the role of government on every, absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think if, if I had understood better how it operates, how the party operates, how the municipalities, the party chiefs, the, the whole system works, if, if, if there were classes for that, uh, I would have saved a lot of money and <laughs> a lot of time. Good business, good business. <laughs> Yes, I would have to say along those lines that whatever the government wants to do, they can do. And so when you look at, for instance, they want to migrate people from the rural areas to the cities and the impact that that makes on building a middle class that's bigger than the entire population of the USA within a very short time period. And then so how do you respond to something that changes that rapidly? Absolutely. Yeah, from, from my side, I mean, Chevrolet's been there a long time uh, in China. Um, the first dealership in Shanghai was there in the 20s. Um, and, and even with that, you, you learn things along the way. And I think the thing that we learned is really the importance of words, you know, and how important words are. So we have a sponsorship with Manchester United. Um, and um, that's about playing soccer, right? And so the platform for, for it, the sort of the strategic platform, is the power of play. And when you talk to the Chinese, they don't play. And so when we, we started to roll out this, this communications platform called the power of play and who do you play for, we don't play, we work. And so it's, it's understanding um, how, the, how the words really come into play. It's less about so much the government thing, but understanding really the consumer over there. Interesting. Chris? I mean, I think for me, it didn't take me very long to figure out, actually. Um, but I, I did wish I knew beforehand was uh, it is very, it's like impossible to know the China consumer. And in, in my company, we do a lot of consumer uh, focused innovation for products, services, and things like that. And so we're, we're very familiar with doing deep qualitative research. And in other markets, you know, you sort of spend a lot of time and you get close to the people and you, 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 you come with the, the perspective that like we can, we can sort of gain insights and really understand this market. And in China, it's really not true. Um, and if anyone tells you that, they're lying. You can't know the China consumer because they change so fast. Um, aside from all the things that, that the panel mentioned, I mean, it's the product, uh, the product cycles are just so fast. And, the, and the, the market is just flooded with uh, brands and products. So it's, 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 a very, uh, it's a very slippery market to sort of get to know and really feel like you have a handle on. Got it. Um, Tim, I'd like to pick up something on you, that you said um, about the importance of words. What messaging do you think works in, in marketing? And it obviously yeah. depends on what industry we're talking about, but are there any broader truths there? Yeah, well, I mean, I think what Chris was saying about you know, how things change quickly, um, brands are important over there, but they're also really fluid, right? You know, there, there's a tendency to apply a brand. I mean, we see it in the automotive category. Um, where they'll recognize the brand. Uh, Buick is a sister brand of ours, which is, you know, someone was asking me this morning um, about why we do so well in China. Well, it's because the last emperor had a Buick, right? So when General Motors decided to go into China uh, in the 90s, um, the, the logical brand to go in with was Buick. But there's a tendency to just apply the names, and, and so it's, it's a, it's a ch tough branding uh, challenge because they value what a brand is. But really, what's behind it um, becomes becomes really more difficult to to build an identity uh, for the company. I mean, there's ones that have done it for sure, but it, that that's that's sort of related to this issue of words, you know, mm -hmm. and promises, really. Absolutely, and obviously. Um what other consumers think is important in any market, but I think it's particularly important in China, product reviews. Um, Candice, do you mind talking a little bit about, about why you think that is and how brands can appro approach that reality? Yeah, I think it's really important for a brand to have a point of difference in China because one of the things that you deal with is that whatever you put out there can be replicated really quickly and really fast. And so to be able to make sure that you build a brand and build something around it and make your packaging distinct. So for instance, one of the things, one of our biggest products in China is an all plant protein powder. 
put it, you know, it's easy for them to get protein, scoop it onto their food in the morning. But when we initially launched it, it was in a metal can. And we found out that that metal can was replicated and everybody's graphics began to look like the Nutrilite graphics. Mm -hmm. And so we had to very quickly develop a proprietary package that was almost you know, repl replicatable yeah. proof, yeah. If, if, you, if you can call it that, yeah. such that people still go by your brand because they can make their brand look like your brand. And so making sure that you build a brand in such a way that they know it's you, something that's distinguishable. So ours had a, a, a leaf and we implanted that leaf in the lid such that they couldn't you know, recreate it unless mm -hmm. they were going to put, put all of this equipment in. And you have to go to those lengths to protect your brand because you spend all this money building it and then someone's going to make theirs look like yours and, and take away the share and you can't let that happen. Um, Chris, have you noticed any um, interesting strategies in terms of um, customer uh, monitoring customer feedback? E-commerce is obviously a huge trend in mm -hmm. China, mm -hmm. even more so than it is in America. Um, how are Western companies able to perceive how their how their product is being ripped off, or also how consumers are even reacting to their product? Are there any interesting strategies? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, well, there's there's so many stories about companies like learning about exactly what Candace is talking about and, and sort of different strategies that you can take to, to kind of to, to stem that or, or to even work with it. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the main things, again, kind of going back to the surprising element, is um, just how quickly consumer perceptions can, can sort of move away from something that you know, they once trusted. And it's, there's this, this kind of what, we, what I call the kind of the, the, we're moving out of the safety era where a lot of safety concerns are being raised by consumers because of food scandals and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, and we're kind of moving into what we think of as like the quality era where consumers are really demanding better, uh, better quality products and things that are better for them. And the, the channel that, that really happens on is, is, uh, is all social media. It's WeChat and Weibo. And these are the areas where I think the best brands are really, really good at sort of constantly monitoring these channels and really really participating in them quickly because you know one negative or one kind of rumor about a product you know and like millions of consumers sort of change their mind are we seeing know? the same movement towards sponsored um, tweets or sp kind of sponsored um, comments in the same way on social media sites as we are in I th I think it's the West? I think it'll happen. I mean, I think, I think it is happening, but I think it's, it's definitely not hit a critical mass yet. You know, I think, I think most of the perception driving is still at the consumer level. You know, there, there are different um, kind of, some consumers are quite influential uh, on social media in China, and they are driving a disproportionate amount of the, of the perceptions online. Um, but I think we will start to see more and more sort of sponsored tweets. Um, uh, you know, celebrity endorsement is also a huge, huge area that um, I'm sure these guys can, can talk a lot about, but that's something that we see as um, really outsized in China versus Western markets. I was reporting a story about the movie business um, in the fall in China, and one of the things that really surprised me was what a high share of um, even A-list actors' income comes from attending events. Mm -hmm. um, you get paid to show up at clubs, wear certain clothes, and then obviously do ad campaigns. Um, is that a big area of focus for you, celebrities? I, I mean, for us, for sure, um, China is waiting for Transformers 4 this fall, you know? And so if you, if you see a Chevrolet there, it's most likely yellow and it's Bumblebee. And, and so um, <laughs> I was saying earlier to some of the panelists, uh, the beauty of Detroit is you can build almost anything there, right? So they created the movie set there. And so downtown Detroit for a short period of time this past summer looked like, like China. Uh, but um, the, the, the power of the American brands um, is, is pretty impressive and, and incredibly powerful. Um, we're working on a project with Disney there in Shanghai. So the, the celebrity and it's more even the American brands are really important. Even um, a vehicle line that we have here in the States like Malibu uh, in China um, is, is, this, uh, is this sort of dream possibility. And so we, we did experiential programs where we took people uh, from China and consumers, and they drove down the coast from San Francisco down the PCH to, to Malibu. So it's about the lifestyle and the imagery uh, of, of celebrity and, and, and American brands. Got it. Yep. 
Yeah. Can that No, I'm chuckling that. because he says transformers, and you'll see with yeah. us the Neutralite ads with the transformer with that yes. spoon yeah. that I was talking about with go. the one scoop for <laughs> the We should do, it, we should do a, a partnership. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> in China, it, it's, a, it's hilarious. So. We go. Mm -hmm. I, know, I, I think that um, actually that is changing very fast, but um, the sense of uh, for Chinese is still a very fragmented market in the majority of the categories, mm -hmm. and and these uh, brands are pretty big here, but are very small there. So still in the majority of the markets, there's a lot of land grabbing, and and the bigness plays a big role there because when you are big. Um, you are on CCTV and you are successful. And if you are successful, it's because you are delivering something superior. Um, and, and definitely uh, having endorsements and having big sponsorships is a great way to show your bigness. So mm -hmm. using my, in my world, we, uh, we sponsored Harbin, which is our uh, number one brand in China, Harbin beer, uh, with um, Shaquanil and, and um, and then BA, and we were also the first Chinese brand to sponsor the World Cup, uh, last World Cup, and that helped so much. You can imagine, you know, what that did to the brand. So I, I still think, yes, that uh, sponsorships and and having endorsers uh, can give you a lot on on, on on that sense. However, I think that's changing a lot. Um, so being big is no longer enough, and I think that Chinese are really, really changing and searching for authenticity. And I think that the digital world is, it, is what gives them this power of searching and having their own opinion. And so being big, I, I think is no longer enough. Mm. Um, I, I wanna actually move to how you um, spend um, on advertising and marketing in, and in terms of media. But I guess my first question is, is it entirely a choice? Um, it's rumored that Western brands, in order to gain access, have to advertise on CCTV, that that's kind of an, a necessity. Is, have you found that to be true? Well, it, it um, lately changed because the regional TV stations uh, gain a lot of popularity. Five years ago was a must. Uh, five years ago, if you were not on CCTV, you were not national. Now you can be national, not only through CCTV, but five years ago or six years ago, you would go to a point of sale, a very you know, simple restaurant, and you would see brands with posters and with the symbol of CCTV on the poster. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, as you saw on TV, it was like, as you saw on CCTV. It, w mm. it was a way to show how big you were. Uh, now you have other options. Okay, got it. Um, online video is obviously a really big trend among young people around the world. It's particularly true in China because the content on CCTV is uh, much more controlled than um, elsewhere. And so people can see Western shows, they can see very creative Chinese shows in China. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you guys are approaching online video. And maybe I could start with you, Tim. I mean, um, in terms of investment, for the most part, even in, in digital, it's it's completely different profile than what we have here in the states. It's it's about forty percent of our marketing dollars mm -hmm. going uh, into digital in China, uh, especially when you're talking about reaching uh, to this sort of growing, you know, new consumer, these three hundred million strong that's here on the on the podium. But um, we are we are working with content providers to, to to serve up relevant content. We have a program that's going here now. Um, with our with our soccer program with with Man U, um, you know Man U as a brand in China. The reason we we decided to to go with that um, is that they have about 600 million fans, but 325, 350 of them are are in Asia. And so this fall, the, the Chevrolet bow tie will now appear on on the jersey. And so from a content perspective, we're working uh, with an organization out of the UK uh, to develop program not so much programming but content. Uh, around um, soccer, and for sure it won't be about playing, it'll be about something else, but I mean, it'll, it'll be about uh, connecting with, with those consumers and serving that up uh, for the Chinese. Got it. Um, Candice, is your marketing spend on digital as high as 40% or what's no, the it's not. No, yeah. it's not as high as 40%, but one of the, some of the things that we have done is actually taken digital and brought gaming to it. Mm. And so we educate about our brands, particularly the, the Neutralite brand, which is a, um, vitamin supplement brand, and you and it's hard to explain, and so you can use gaming and tell a story, 
and actually enable them to learn about it on their own mm -hmm. through that game. What kind of uptake have you had with something like that? How popular do these things become? They become extremely popular. And so, so you know, we'll, we'll do that. And then the thing about China is you can shift, push things out, and you can drive things to it. So we use WeChat quite a bit. WeChat gets to 600 million people in China, so we can push it out that way, mm -hmm. and then they can push it out even further, and that's a, that's a very easy way. Got it, and it. so that, that's actually a sponsored message that comes to people through WeChat, or it how does it? Uh, yes, okay. so, yeah, so we're very active in WeChat as, uh, as an organization, and we use that to leverage to put our messages out there and put the stories out there that we'd like to, Thanks. and then the things that we want to help consumers understand about our brands, mm -hmm. and so that, yes, so that's how we do it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And Miguel, what is the breakdown of your spend, and um, what, what media are you most excited about in China? Uh, we are very excited, of course, with the digital world. Um, and, and as you were talking about on online video, uh, we are very excited with, uh, you know, producing content for, for, for the digital world. And just mentioning one, this is the year of the horse in China. And we have the beautiful Clydesdales here in the United <laughs> States. Um, Budweiser is our number one premium beer in the U.S. We took the Clydesdales to, to China. Yeah. And we transformed that into chap eight chapters. Um, eight uh, chapters that transforming the content of the Clydesdales going to China. Um, and was, you know, puzzled as the success that we had with uh, 200 million views mm -hmm. following the chapters like a chapter by chapter on the, the Clydesdales arrive in China. So it's not only being on digital, but it's really how you approach digital. And um, we are investing a lot on, on content. I think that content is, is, is not about how much you spend only, it's, it's the way you spend. And I think having a mentality of producing content is the way. Um, Chris, do you have any thoughts on how people should be thinking about um, about the digital opportunity in particular and creative ways to market? Well, what's interesting when I listen to this is that um, what we see behaviorally is the, all the places people are actually consuming the video. And it's true, I mean, WeChat is just, a, it's, it's hard to sort of overstate how transformative that has been in China. Um, but it's interesting because we, you know, th there's a lot of, um, other places people are consuming video, and um, you see this especially in tier one and two, two cities that you know, you'd go into a lobby or you're waiting in an elevator or even in a taxi, and these are increasingly becoming sort of primary uh, viewing channels for video. And it's, it's basically mobile and you know, some, some key public places, and I think that's, and when I first arrived to China, that was, that was already happening five years ago. I thought that was a little bit interesting. Um, but that's, that's actually what we found with some of our clients. That's actually their primary uh, communication channel. Like they're not on CCTV. They don't do a lot of web um, uh, communication. It's, it's actually these channels and, and they're extremely successful. Um, I mean, our, our media folks tell us that one out of four sort of smartphone mobile is in China, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's the primary screen rather than the secondary screen over there. And there's a hunger for sort of as you said, the content. I mean, there's there's serial sort of narrative content Stories. is actually becoming dominant. You know, just when we talk to consumers, when we talk to a lot of young consumers, and there's there's a real hunger, and I think there's a real um, um, you know inclination towards content that is that is more story driven. Mm -hmm. You know, because they're not getting that in exactly. in other channels. Absolutely. Um, how do you think about where to invest dollars? I mean, Miguel, you were saying that it's a, an incredibly vast, diverse country, um, tons of tier one, two, and now three, four cities. Um, where do you focus, and how do you decide? Miguel, can I start with you? I think each one of us has its own reasons to invest here or there, but what I learned um, from my experience was really understanding our competitors and understanding where their profit pools are, uh, because since everybody's is fighting for the same territories. Understanding your competition very well is critical mm -hmm. because um, everybody tries to make money in one place and destroy the other one in another place and, and then keep growing and keep expanding throughout the country. So I think planning is critical. Um, and it's not about, in my opinion, about if it's the tier one city or the tier two city is, is specifically where. And, and, you know, and, and, and that, that is related to the competition situation. And I, I believe that each one of us 
has different competitors and as a consequence, uh, you know, priorities should be in different areas. So for us, um, uh, priorities were not in Shanghai or in Beijing. For us, priorities were in, in places such as Sichuan or Yunnan. You know, not very traditional places to really to to to, to start or or to grow. That, that's something. Uh, just to jump in there, I mean, that's something that that I think maybe maybe doesn't get talked about as much, at least in China. Uh, it might in 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 the West, but. You know that China is is very much a a market of many markets. It's a multi-market market. So, the the value to premium um, spectrum is always going to be there everywhere. And we also, I mean, even in consulting with companies like yours, we 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 don't think of it in, tier, in terms of tiers, or or even honestly in terms of socioeconomic class uh, A consumers, B consumers. Sometimes, but it's it's actually that that, that kind of value to premium curve, and and how do you actually kind of resonate with that in these different regional markets. Um, that's, that's a very interesting thing. Sometimes it can be opportunistic. I mean, we were very fortunate about four years ago when the gold skating pair won the gold medal in the, the Olympics in China. They were very revered by the government. They almost, you know, they were the government's children. They'd been skating together for 17 years. And after winning the gold, they were allowed to get married. So it was very important to make a big deal out of, out of this from the Olympic Committee and the government of China. And so they wanted them to get married on ice. And they decided that they wanted it to be called Artistry on Ice. Our beauty brand is called Artistry. And so they actually approached us and said, would you be willing to sponsor um, that? And that has turned into what was a kind of a one event four years ago to now it, it is done every year in the summertime, spreading across five major cities in China, and it has just bolstered their their ice skate because that's the other thing they wanted to do was they wanted to be known for skating beyond this pair, and so it was a way to build our brand in ways that we never expected, at, but it also made us a, a strong partners with the government and with the Olympic Committee. Um, Tim, how quickly are you scaling up the, in terms of new markets in China? That I mean, trying? the transition is moving into the smaller cities. Um, you know, in the category that we're in, and and as a, a relatively new brand, old brand, um, vehicles are something that you want to touch and feel, right? So um, experiential is an important part of the mix over there, where um, we, we, we take these tours around. They, they did about 1,000 cities last year. Um, in China, uh, moving vehicles in so that people can touch and feel and see what a Chevrolet is about. So um, we try and use all of the all of the mix, uh, and it is moving. It's moving um, out into the cities. I think the really interesting challenges, and that's why all the car companies are there, right? Uh, if the forecasters are correct, by 2022 there'll be 33 to 34 million cars sold in China a year. So this creates big challenges with um, urban congestion, and it's already a problem in, in, in the bigger cities. But um, you know, it, it, it's it, there's gold in those hills, right? You know, in terms of, of going over there, the, the key is to kind of to mine it and bring it back. Uh, and so we, 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 we definitely have a lot of challenges in terms of, of, of cracking into the, into the smaller markets, but also dealing with the issue of congestion. Got it. Um, turning more toward the regulatory point, um, I'm sure everyone would love to actually sign up for a crash course in, mm -hmm. in this. Um, could, you, could you share a little bit of your insights about, I mean, it's incredibly challenging for Western brands to yeah. know, partially because regulations change sure. all the time, just like the Chinese consumer changes sure. all the time. They possibly change even more. Yeah. Um, how do you approach um, regulation? And could you give us a bit about your strategy there? Um, Tim, do you mind, sorry? I mean, you know, for us, um, it, it's partnerships, right? Joint venture partnerships, and so we rely on the on the, on the JV partner to help us navigate some of that. Um, and um, and who is your partner? In China? Um, it's Shanghai General Motors, it, but it's it's in fact, which is government. It's, um, it's government, yeah. Okay. So and um, that that's that's how that's how we kind of have a foot in the door from that perspective. Got it. Yes. And that was the only way to get in, right? Of uh, course. Back right. in '93. Right. So, for, for us, the learning was necessity. Um, we opened Amway in, uh, in China in 1995, and within two years, the, the government banned direct selling. So the business was completely out. 
And so we had very strong government relations, people who actually had worked in the government before and said, we've got to work together. So we worked with them to understand what it would take to have direct selling in China. One of the rules was you must allow the consumers to touch and feel the product, to experience mm -hmm. the product before they purchase. Mm -hmm. So out of that became our physical presence strategy, and we started opening up physical presence locations, in essence, what you would consider a retail store. Stores. And so we now have over 300 across China, and have exported that to other countries because it's made us successful. China is our largest market as a result of that. Got it, so that you're able to have that presence and then also that, that, that's what allows you to do direct selling. That's, a, that's what allows us to do direct selling. Interesting, okay. Um, do other people find that to be a challenge for entering China now who are interested in doing direct selling or is it fairly easy to open um, stores and catch up? It, it, real estate is expensive right. um, and uh, no, it's not easy. And anytime you're going into China, you still have to deal with the government, even if you're in a category that already exists. Again. I, well, uh, my sector is considered not a strategic sector, so probably it's very different from if I was in communications or energy. But actually, maybe the biggest surprise I had in China is how pro-business the government is. Um, I was, and I'm still so impressed how you know they have their targets as we have our targets. And so we speak the same language. I think about top line growth, they think about tax collection. I'm talking about government in the provinces, in the cities. I think about profitability, they, they are thinking about you know, um, um, GDP and, and tax collection. Um, I'm thinking about building breweries, they are thinking about uh, how many jobs they, are, they, they have to, to open or to, to create. Is the same language and is very pragmatic, and I think that that is so fresh and so different from the rest of the world in terms of, of politicians. That I think makes uh, for business people, uh, if you understand that, uh, makes our lives much easier. So great and a lot of positive surprises with uh, uh, government in China. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, there's well, there's so many kind of horror stories. It's refreshing to hear that that perspective because I, I also I feel the same way. I mean, we 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 see a lot of um, companies struggle with the, the shifting the dynamic the uh, dynamics of of the the regulatory. Um, but I think that again, the the companies that have been very successful, the ones that that understand that it's sort of, sort of the knowledge knowledge exchange is sort of a tool. Um, and that can be maybe one of the best tools, you know, to kind of work with the government. And I think that's that's something that um, you know certainly companies at scale have. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 one of those. It kind of goes in the category of you know truths to know before you get to China. <laughs> it is interesting because the government is pro business, um, and yet. And there is a celebration of the middle class rising um, and consumption, but there's also an uneasiness with it. And we saw that in the reaction to this movie, Tiny Times, which is um, kind of clueless meets sex in the city in China, kind of tons of walk-in closets and designer bags. And the government ultimately was really uncomfortable with the celebration of wealth. Um, it gets to the question that I asked earlier about messaging. Um, is that a delicate, do you find that to be a delicate balance in your marketing yet? Um, in terms of encouraging consumption, but not necessarily what would be conceived of as bad values. Tim, could I ask you? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the, the sector, the category, the market that we play in is different than some of the other luxury brands yeah. that have gone in ahead of us. Um, we rolled out last year, really for the first time at Chevrolet, a global tagline, global positioning called Find Your Roads. Uh, and it is being used now in, in every market around the world. And um, as we move from market to market, really what we're saying underneath is it's about possibilities and what, what a vehicle can do for you, you know, in terms of getting you from point A to point B. And so that's kind of the space Emphasize that we're- the practical. Yeah, but also the, the sense of what, what is possible. And I think when you look at China, that's all about what's possible, right? I mean, when I saw the Olympics there a few years ago, I was just like, wow, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's really, uh, a country that's that, that's on the move and wants to really go somewhere. And so um, I think from that perspective, the brand value uh, and, the, and the position that we hold in that market is, is pretty well aligned. But it gets, it's not about 
um, look at my fancy car so much, you know what I mean? It, it, the, the, the fundamentals underneath of what we stand for of, of good design and good performance and technology, um, I think are, are aligned and not necessarily in conflict mm -hmm. um, with, with where they want to go there. Sure. You know, I also find that with your brands, you can do well with them, but you also then have to do, do something good for the country. So yeah. we're in the nutrition business and one of it, so our nutrition brand Nutrilite does well, but we also have developed what we call the Spring Sprouts Kitchens through our charity foundation in the rural areas where the children might eat only rice. And so we're providing them with the ability to build gardens and then have those vegetables. And so tying in that with the part of your business also helps. A and lot. is that um, a request of the local governments, or are you actually hearing that from consumers who expect CSR? Well, well, the governments, it's it's a bit of a, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a request. I would say it makes things go much smoother <laughs> when you're figuring out how to help them achieve what they need to do. And one of them is, you know, kind of the poverty. And a lot of these children are children are left in either orphanages or they're left alone while they're parents go elsewhere to work mm. in a factory. So they may be left alone all week and their parents, not alone, I mean, but in these centers mm -hmm. all week and then their parents come back um, during the weekend. And so this is something that they see as an issue of the government and if you can help them solve the issues, it really does help your business. Mm. Um, our business is, um, uh, is a business that brings people together, right? Beer, the fabric of beer is, is to pe put people together and I think that that's extremely important, especially in a place like China, where the growth um, brings a lot of stress. So um, we never, we always uh, felt very, very welcome uh, and never had any type of problem in terms of communication, etc. Just the opposite, um, because I think that there's a there's a very important meaning f and, and for 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 beer in any society, but specifically in China now. Mm, that's true. Um, so it's part of the dinners, it's part of uh, the celebration, it's part of socialization. Got it. So it's interesting, we hear a lot about Chinese appetite for Bordeaux, expensive Bordeaux. We don't hear as much about the beer. So. Yeah, but the Bordeaux is just for the cream of the cream of the cream, right? So um, the vast majority of the population does not know what a Bordeaux is. What they aspire is to trade up, and what they aspire is to trade up from a regular beer to a Budweiser beer, which is the leading premium brand in the country. So, um, and, and, uh, and, and that's, that's where we are. Mm -hmm. sure. um, Chris, I'd like to ask you about demography in China. Everyone's very excited about consumer spending, but we see with mm -hmm. the one-child policy that there will, and with the aging of the population, that there will be significant resources and time spent on caring for elders. How is that going to affect uh, the opportunity for Western brands? Yeah, it's it's this is something that is a, a growing concern for for everyone. But the, we've all heard of the sort of the four to one family, which is uh, four grandparents and two parents and to one child. And you know, this is in the next sort of ten to twenty years, we think that this is going to create um, this kind of kind of sandwich generation in the middle, which is really not considered, I think, by traditional marketers, very upwardly mobile or very aspirational because they have such a kind of a, a burden of taking care of the, the, yeah, the parents and then also of their kids. And so um, this is something that's kind of like, it's interesting because that's, you, you know, the kind of 25 to 40-ish, that's the group that's usually, you know, spending a lot. But in China, we see that this is, it's translating into behavior that's sort of like, they're looking for, for, for uh, products that are sort of better enough than what they have, but not really going for premium. Um, and, and sort of we're seeing that shift down to the younger, demo, you know, the, the younger um, uh, demographics, so, you know, teens and, and early 20s. Uh, and that's really interesting because that's also aided by the, the kind of the, the uh, uh, digital kind of uh, platform as, as where most of them are spending. But the, yeah, this kind of sandwich generation is going to be very interesting to figure out how to really kind of resonate with them um, as, they, as they kind of live with this tension of, you know, t taking care of their their parents and managing their own children. Yeah, it's a really interesting conundrum.
Um, I want to go back to e-commerce just because it is such an important consumption trend and it affects different categories very differently. I don't think we're going to be seeing cars sold anytime soon. Food products? Alcohol? What, is there an opportunity in terms of e-commerce in China? For sure there is, uh, but it's still on diapers, so <laughs> not much to say. <laughs> okay. What about consumer good, Kanda? Very popular. I mean, I think that it will be a wave of the future, um, but you have to combine it with the experience in and of itself. So your e-commerce may be built around someone having gone in and, again, seen something, and then you make that purchase experience very exciting, um, or you bring them in through another channel, and, but still make the e-commerce experience one that they enjoy, because they love entertainment, and they love to be entertained in every aspect of what they do. Yeah, it's interesting. I do feel like brands are actually more experimental um, and creative in China than we are seeing them in the West. It's fascinating to hear some of what you guys are working on, because we're not seeing something similar with um, Amazon or YouTube uh, in America. Um, I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience and um, hear if you have any comments to what you've heard or would like to probe the speakers. We have one here. And we'll come with a microphone. If you could say where you're from, please, that would be great. Uh, hey guys, I work from a technology company, or at a technology company that's here in New York. Um, and that, my question comes from that perspective, and it's about um, efforts to create your own digital channel as opposed to using things like Weibo or, um, you know, other chat applications in China to push out stuff like video content. So I hear from a lot of brands that want to create their own custom applications or microsites or games. Um, can you speak to uh, the, the, the share of your digital spend that that kind of stuff comprises? Um, Candice, do you mind starting? You, you mentioned a bit already, mm -hmm. but would you like to go into yes. that? Yes. Um, we are we're seeing our spend increasingly go more towards digital, even though it's not the majority of the spend now. And it's because we're trying to find a way to get our message directly to them. Now, as far as creating our own digital channel, um, you have to do that carefully that's, uh, and making sure that you're doing it in lines with everything that's been approved. But and, what, and what are the main concerns um, in terms of towing the right line with a digital channel that you're thinking about? Uh, you, you have to make sure that you're not doing anything against the policy of the government and you're not putting anything on there that could cause it to be shut down. Okay. And so those are, those are very important things. So everything you do, you do with a fine line of making sure that you either checked with someone or you've got someone constantly looking at it to make sure that doesn't come up because you don't want that. And the, you also don't want consumer complaints about it because very few consumer complaints will cause you to be um, kind of investigated. So you don't need, it doesn't need to be a critical mass. It can be a few and that will cause an investigation. So you wanna be very careful about how you go about doing it and putting it out there. And that's, so I, while I think it's the desire of many right now, that many have not been able to do it yet. Got it. Tim, could you speak a bit Yeah, to I mean, we're, we're not so much into creating our own way. It's more about working through the existing channels. Again, we're a, we're a newer brand um, as Chevrolet, not necessarily as General Motors, but as Chevrolet. So it's not an area yet that we're, we're investing in heavily. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we also don't have the ambition to create our own applications, but, but we have the ambition of creating a lot of uh, content, as I said yeah. before. Mm -hmm. so, we are putting our resources and our priorities on creating content uh, to be on the conversation. Right? Okay. Let's get the next one. We have someone over here. Speaking of what packs reach scale, um, I love the vegetable gardens example. And uh, two years ago at the Economist Healthcare Asia Conference, I asked the Chinese speakers there about how they were going to bring innovation through a variety of sources like social enterprise, which is experimenting with solutions like the vegetable garden, the best way to scale vegetable gardens and others all over the world. And they did not answer. Uh, they smiled and other people answered the question. I learned a lot from that. So the question is, two years later, do you see activities with the government where the government is either bringing innovation in from other sources, looking to partner with innovators who have models that would be solutions to their problems and engaging with corporate partners 
to enable scale of those solutions in ways that will leapfrog kind of the old way of doing it. Yeah. You'd like to take that? I mean, I can say from the automotive perspective, um, urban congestion, even here in New York, but we're talking about China, is going to be a massive challenge, especially if you're going to have 33 or 34 million new cars sold every year. Um, and I would expect, um, particularly coming out of China, this idea of um, autonomous driving um, to, to really catch hold. Um, there's cities over there where they're working on solutions like that and partnering with us. We've shown a vehicle called NV. Uh, and you know, it, 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 it could very well start there and move to other places when you think about um, independence for elderly people here, which would be a different solution, but this whole idea of cars at some point that, that will drive themselves. And that will, that will solve some of the, or hopefully solve it, because um, we tend to be driving like this, although we shouldn't be, right? But the, if the car is driving itself, um, you can get more people through the pipe, if you will. So I, I think um, there's an encouragement there uh, from the government in that space, in our category specifically, uh, to start to work on it. And, and are and they actually investing, are they giving, uh, are they financially I, I, they, incentivizing they, they, people they, to they, do they, that? They, there's encouragement and more than that I can't say, but um, but there's a, a cool vehicle that if you take a look at called uh, NV, for instance, it's got a little Chevrolet bow tie on it. Okay. Uh, looks a little bit sort of like George Jetson, you know. Uh, but um, th this is the future, and you can see it even in the cars that are in market now, right, with adaptive cruise control and lane departure warnings and things like that. Um, this is going to be great. I think one of the most difficult decisions or discussions I ever had with my dad was when I told him he had to stop driving, right? So had he been able to continue in that, it's solving an issue, especially as populations age, uh, and, it, and it, improves, it improves the quality of life. So. Any other questions? I, I will say this. I mean, we, I think the government always takes a very understated approach to, to talking about uh, social initiatives. Um, but, we, but we've seen examples where uh, in, in orphanages, for example, you know, there's, a, there's a tremendous need in, in rural China to, um, to educate children. And, and the government is, is obviously very uh, concerned about this. Um, and has, has opened up to outside uh, organizations from, um, uh, you know, outside China, obviously, the, the, the U.S. And, and Europe, to kind of come in and advise and actually build models for uh, teaching, the, teaching the teachers and, and sort of building, you know, a, a digital platform for that as well as an in-class platform. So we, we're seeing it happen, but we, you, you don't always hear about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be sort of the, the gap there. Yeah. Let's get another question from the audience, just right here in the center. Yeah, back there. Uh, good morning, Mike Woods from Gyro. Uh, I live and work in Michigan, so nice to see two Michigan brands uh, on the stage this morning. Really a question for all of you, but I'll start with Tim. We've talked a lot about uh, direct-to-consumer business. What about channel development? and? Obviously, dealerships are a bricks and mortar business here, well developed. How is it different over there, and uh, you know how are you going to market, and what are some of the challenges? Yeah, I mean, it. Um, you're right. It is a bricks and mortar business um, everywhere. Um, at the end of the day, you have a. You know, if you go back in the history of automotive, um, there was ideas to sell these things through catalogs, right? But at the end of the day, you have to um, s sell them physically and, and transfer them and then service them. And, I, and right now, it is still a, a pretty traditional model uh, in terms of, 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 of how that works. Um, it, technology, um, I think, starts to change uh, how people interact with it. Um, we have something here in the States called point-click drive, where it, it's pretty much a seamless transition all the way through. And, and then fundamentally, at the end, um, you have the ability to pick it up at the dealer. And it, that's still the point of contact. That's still the service location. But I don't see. Um, because of the type of product that we're in, that, that we're ever going to really get away from some sort of physical uh, place. It's not like it can show up in the mail at your house, right? And then you, you they, the key comes, and then you start it. So, um, in some ways, we're we're very old-fashioned, and and but we need to find ways of technology to to, to really put the consumer in charge of that. Of Have that we process. seen any innovations on that front? Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, and not so much in China, but uh, this point-click drive here is, is really where you can configure the vehicle, you can arrange the financing. It's, 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 you know, because 
more and more consumers, um, and I'm, you're all consumers, so you know this, right? You, you, you tend to probably know more about the vehicle when you hit the dealership than the salesperson does because of the research that you're able to do and, and, and the shopping that you're able to do and the comparisons. And so um, I think we're so used to um, other, other industries that make it easy for us, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to find a way to make it easy, easy to buy and service a car as well. Would you like to? Well, you know, our channel, our main channel is still our Amway business owners or the distributors, and that will always be a part of it. I think what we're trying to do is equip them with things through the digital channel where you, we can help with the content and make sure that the messaging and the product story is what we would like it to be. Uh, but our channel is still our channel. Chris, would you like to? Add? Well, we, we, in, uh, in China, a lot of the, the domestic brands are, I think, innovating in this space um, in developing the channel. And I mean, it, there's the, the kind of the recent um, partnership between Hire and Alibaba Group where they're now, they're bringing sort of essentially the showroom to tier three, tier four, tier five via the online, the e -com platform. And Hire's distribution network is delivering same day or the next day and servicing that way. And I think, you know, these are consumers who never, who never, go to the showroom. They never go to the retail floor to see the refrigerators and the washing machines and, and whatnot. And so it's, this is a way of sort of shortcutting that and bringing it right to them. You know, and I think that, and it's happening at scale. So, and it's happening overnight. <laughs> so I think that's, that's something to really think about. Um, it, it, things are happening and I think not all consumers um, necessarily, I mean, this is in all categories, but right. not all consumers necessarily need that experiential thing. You know, I think you're gonna start to see some of that happen in China first. Okay. But isn't that really, I mean, how much of a considered purchase it is, right? I mean, if you're, sure, you're sure. gonna keep cars, a vehicle for seven years, um, you, you want Cars are different. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, ultimately, a fairly optimistic, uh, optimistic group here. Um, I'm sure you can, we can hear sob stories in, in the hall during the coffee break, but it seems like everyone's had a fairly good experience. Anyways, thank you so much for your questions, and we'll bring on the next panel. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks. Thanks.